to everybody. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, unfortunately, uh, Thomas uh, was unable to uh, uh, come due to a uh, uh, unfortunate, uh, from the very unfortunate family uh, event. So um, I'm going to be speaking in his place, or I'm taking his slides, so we'll be able to benefit from his uh, expertise in the slides. The end of this talk, um, it's an hour and a half, right? The talk is an hour and a half, right? If you have it in your schedule. Just to remind me. Uh, in the front of the page, is the front of the book. Benny? How long? Yeah. An hour and a half, yeah? An hour and a half, yeah. Okay, so the aim of the talk is to look at optimizing um, secure computation for semi honest adversaries. And two thirds of the talk will be optimizations for Yao, which also have ramifications to. Uh, and malicious protocols as well, because if we optimize the garbled circuit and the way we compute the garbled circuit, then this will also help us with malicious adversaries as well. And another part of the talk will talk about optimizing GMW, <coughs> and this does not directly uh, um, enable us to get malicious security more efficiently, but it does teach us a lot of principles that can be very helpful for us. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's what we're going to be do, doing uh, today. So again, we're talking about secure two-party computation. We saw this yesterday, so we don't have to go, uh, uh, go into it much. We have semi-honest, we're considering semi-honest adversaries, so they're going to run the protocol execution. They're going to do what they're supposed to do, but they're trying, going to try to learn more by looking at the protocol transcript. The there are many, many applications, just a few of them here that uh, Thomas uh, 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 is talking about. It's auctions, remote diagnostics, DNA searching, biometric identification, Medical diagnostics, all of these things require privacy in order to uh, manage to utilize the data. You want, to, you want to somehow utilize it and maintain privacy at the same time, and that's what we can do using secure imputation. Oblivious transfer, we saw yesterday, but just to remind uh, those of you who came today and those of you who fell asleep yesterday, uh, we have two inputs to the first party, to the sender or to Alice, X0 and X1. The uh, receiving party, Bob, has uh, a bit, which uh, here we denote by R, and the uh, output is X sub R, so Bob receives either X0 or X1, depending on what uh, his input is. And this is an essential building block, and making it very, very efficient is of great importance. And Benny talked yesterday about OT extensions, and I'll expand on them uh, that again today. How do we measure efficiency of a protocol? So the obvious one is the running time. It's also not so simple because it depends on the implementation and the scenario. So if we want to compare, it's actually one of the big problems in the field that we don't, it's only now becoming empirical and we don't really have reasonable benchmarks or reasonable practices or scientific practices for comparing when a protocol is better than another one. Uh, you know, the, the common practice of highly optimizing my protocol and then, you know, implementing really badly someone else's protocol and then showing that I'm better is uh, are not the most scientific of methods. Uh, also, the scenario is very, very different if I'm running where on two machines that are very far apart and have a, a very uh, high latency network or if I'm running on two machines that are close together. What's the scenario that I'm interested in? What's realistic? It depends very much on all of those factors. So we can also uh, um, count communication. We can talk about the number of bits that are sent, but also the number of rounds. And it makes a very big difference in the type of network that I'm on. So if I have, uh, um, if I'm, I have a network which has ver two, two, two parties are very far apart, so I might have a, uh, a high bandwidth communication, but it's a very low latency, very high latency because they're very far apart, and having many rounds of communication will actually make it more expensive. Whereas uh, if I'm on, uh, if the two parties are very close to each other, but they have very uh, low bandwidth communication, then actually having sending many bits may be a problem. So let's say you want to do secure two-party computation between two mobiles. They're actually very close to each other. So the latency may not be so bad, it probably will be as well, but the latency may not be so bad, but I have a very low bandwidth channel. So maybe I'll prefer to have many rounds of communication, but sending only a few bits each time. 
And if I have two massive, two very strong servers who are connected with a very, very, with a very, very uh, uh, high bandwidth uh, communication channel, I may want to do something different. What about computation? So computation is also, it may sound very simple, okay, let's just count uh, how many operations that I do. And uh, the problem is that this is also uh, very, very tricky to do right and it can be very, very misleading. I grew up, uh, not as I grew up when I was in uh, uh, grade school, but grew up as a cryptographer understanding that the bottleneck is always going to be cryptographic operations. As soon as you have to do an exponentiation, this is going to cost a huge amount of work and as soon as you have to do uh, even a symmetric uh, operation it's going to be expensive. However, that's not, that, that's changed a lot. The cost of an exponentiation if it's for example elliptic curve of elliptic curve group is very, is very, very cheap. It's a couple of hundred microseconds. The cost of uh, doing a symmetric operation for, if I'm doing AES and I have the AES and I chip then this is really, really cheap. Uh, if I need to do a Payer uh, encryption, this is going to be much more expensive because I need much bigger keys. It's sort of all over the place and it's unclear and sometimes even, you know, if I'm doing AES, this can be cheaper than reading from memory. So, we can count the number of module exponentiations, uh, multiplications, hash function evaluation, block cipher evaluation, XORs, but are these also all that is needed? And I'll show you at the end of the talk today that actually non-cryptographic operations can also be a huge factor. So counting and saying I'm going to compare my protocol to someone else's and my protocol is better because I have half the number of exponentiations and a quarter of the number of uh, symmetric operations, my protocol may actually be slower. So this is the big challenge, understanding uh, how do we compare protocols. It, it's, it's difficult because if I was to say, okay, so let's just throw out all this theoretical counting and go only for runtime, then I come back to the problem of how do I properly compare different protocols. So, this is also everything that we're talking about in this school, the, it's moving really, really fast. So, you know, things that we teach you in this school, if you come to this coming upcoming crypto, uh, you will see a Eurocrypt, you'll see that already it's out of date. Uh, so, things are really moving very quickly and, and I guess the aim of the school is to be able to follow what's going on. That, of, of obviously, to do, do the research yourself, but at least to be able to follow what's going on. So in this lecture, uh, this, is, this is a slide that uh, uh, Thomas uh, uh, likes to show where he builds the, uh, uh, how, how, sort of how, how we get protocols. If you want to build a generic protocol, the way you build a generic protocol is to go through a circuit. By like Boolean, not necessarily. On Wednesday, Ivan will talk about uh, arithmetic circuits. So if we have a Boolean circuit and then we can use either Yao or GMW. If we do GMW, GMW, from what Benny told you yesterday, is based on OT and XORs, which say one time pads. So that's all you really need for GMW. You need OT and one time pad. But how do you do OT? OT requires public key crypto, symmetric crypto, and also XORing. Why? This is the OT extension. You do some public key crypto to do your base OTs, then you do symmetric crypto, and then you do uh, XORing. Whereas YAL is based on OT and symmetric crypto. You do OT on the input wires and then symmetric crypto to compute each gate. So how do we make all of these things efficient? Well, for YAL we want to make sure that we want to make the garbled circuits efficient. Okay, so the way we compute, construct and compute the garbled circuits. We're going to, we're going to need efficient OTs. That's going to be for both YAL and for GMW. Uh, we're going to want to optimize circuits because if we're using a Boolean circuit then obviously if I can take the same function and make a Boolean circle that will have 30,000 gates or will have 20,000 gates then that will be uh, very very that will give very different run times not only that as we'll see it also makes a big difference what type of gates there are are they XOR gates are they AND gates in GMW we already saw this in GMW if you have an AND gate, you need interaction. And if you have an XOR gate, then everyone just does a local computation. So in GMW, at least, XOR gates are for free. And AND gates are not. And we'll see that this is also the case in YAL. And what that means is that there is now a brand new problem. The brand new problem is, can you construct a circuit that minimizes the number of AND gates at the expense of more XOR gates? This is something that engineers never looked at. 30, 40 years ago when they were looking at building circuits because they wanted to use NAND gates because they were actually cheaper to implement, I think it's NAND, cheaper to implement in hardware 
than uh, other types of gates, cheaper than XOR gates, and they want to minimize those number of gates, but, uh, or, or definitely not at the expense of XOR, so they would want less XOR than NAND. So it's a completely different problem and it's something that we can collaborate with other communities on. So this is Yale's protocol. You saw it yesterday, so I'll just do it very, very, ah, uh, yeah, just do it very, very quickly. So we have some circuit here, for example, it's a comparator circuit, uh, and then the circuit is garbled. We have garbled values in the circuit. We have a garbled table, uh, which is just an encryption of the garbled wires. So each wire is given two long random values, two, essentially two encryption keys, and we garble the input wires to the output wires to enable uh, it to be computed. Bob then sends this garbled circuit to Alice, along with the wires, the garbled values that are associated with its input. And they then do oblivious transfer for Alice to receive the garbled values that are associated with her input. And now she's able to actually compute that garbled circuit because she has one uh, garbled value on each input wire. And now she can go gate by gate and decrypt each gate, as Benny showed you yesterday, uh, decrypting each, each gate one at a time until she gets to the output wires and then she can get the output of the circuit. Okay? So for this, we need efficient garbled circuits and we need efficient oblivious transfer, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And also, sorry, we also need efficient circuits. Because the more efficient we make the circuits, the more efficient the entire thing is. GMW, uh, again, briefly reviewing it, we have the parties have, uh, on every input wire, they have a sharing of their bits, a simple XOR sharing of their inputs. And uh, for XOR gates, they can just locally XOR the shares that they have on the input wires of the gate. For AND gates, they need to run an interactive protocol that Benny showed uh, yesterday using uh, one out of four oblivious transfer. And then they recombine the outputs at the very end. So it goes through one by one each of the gates, and they need to interact for every AND gate. Obviously, if you were to implement this, you wouldn't send a different packet for every AND gate. You would do uh, each uh, uh, level of the circuit, okay? Because otherwise it would be ridiculously slow. Here, once again, we need efficient circuits in order to make this efficient. Okay, so the first tool that I'm going to show you, and this is something that will appear both tomorrow and on Wednesday, is a beautiful concept by Beaver. Actually, Beaver has a number of really classic results from the uh, uh, from the 90s that. Uh, uh, prevented the, he presented them in for, for their purely theoretical value most of the time, but they're actually very, very useful today. Also, it's very interesting that Yao and GMW, which, are, which were, again, protocols that were not ever intended to actually be efficient, but they were intended to prove feasibility results that you can actually just compute anything, turn out today to still be the basis for the best protocols that we have. This is very, very interesting. Uh, Okay, so the aim, uh, what, what our aim now is we want to compute what we call a multiplication triple, which is, I uh, hope everyone can see this, can, did the colors show up? Okay. I hope so. Uh, which is basically A1, B1, and C1, and A2, B2, and C2, so that we have the property that A1, X, or A2 times B1, X, or B2 equals C1, X, or C2. So differently, B, P1 is going to get A1, B1, and C1. P2 is going to get A2, B2, and C2. And the property is that if we look at A to be A1, X, or A2, and B and C in the same way, that A times B equals C. So it's like a correlated, and they're all random. So they want to generate this, what we call a multiplication triple, which is a set of three correlated uh, random values. Each one has three bits. Each of the A1, B1, and C1 just bits. Each one has three bits that look completely random, but they are correlated in the sense that A times B equals C. Why do we want to do this? I'll show you in a moment. Uh, just note that when we uh, multiply it out, you get that C1, X, or C2 equals A1, B1 plus A2, B1 plus A1, B2 plus A2, B2. Why is that important? We'll note that A1, B1, P1 can compute by himself. A2, B2, P2 can compute by herself. And they only need to collaborate to compute A2, B1 and A1, B2. Okay? Because that's, uh, uh, that's something which involves information from both of them. So here's a protocol. Uh, it's again, it's somewhat uh, magic. 
And magic basically means it's very hard to get intuition. You just have to look at the algebra and work it out by hand, and you say, wow, cool, it actually works. So P1 chooses two random bits, M0 and M1, and P2 chooses a random bit, A2. Okay, A2 will be her actual A2 at the end. And then P1 and P2 run an oblivious transfer. P1 will input M0 and M1, and P2 will input A2, and that means she'll get back U2, which is M sub A2. So the M value she gets back depends on the A2 value that she chose, either M0 or M1. Then P1 sets B1 to be M1 XOR M1, M0, sorry, XOR M1, and V1 to be M0. I know it makes no sense. And what I want you to observe is that V1 XOR U2 is M0 XOR MA2. Okay, that's just by definition because uh, V1 is M0 and U2 is MA2. Okay, so if I do V1 XOR U2, I get that, that relation. Now let, let's look at what happens if A2 equals 0. If A2 equals 0, then V1 XOR U2 equals M0 XOR M0, which is just 0. That actually equals A2 B1. Why does it equal A2 B1? Because A2 is 0, so 0 times anything is 0. But I hope that everyone at this time of the morning is still okay doing <coughs> Okay, so if A2 equals 0, then we get that V1 XOR U2 equals A2 B1, because it's 0. If A2 equals 1, then V1 XOR U2 actually equals M0 XOR M1, because it's M0 XOR MA2, but A2 equals 1, so it's M0 XOR M1, and we defined B1 to be M0 XOR M1. So that's B. And now again, A2 equals 1, so B equals 1 times B. So what we get is that no matter what the cases are, V1 XOR U2 actually equals this A2 B1, which was the challenge because we said that these are the values that they have to compute in a joint way. So they've now chosen, uh, what they've chosen, they've chosen A2 and B1, and they have, a, they have the property that they can actually, uh, they actually are able to each, throughout the, that the XOR, the values they have, will give A2 B1. Now they do the exact thing again in the opposite direction, but using A1 and B2 and U1 and V2, and they get the same thing. Okay, they get the same thing in the reverse direction. And now P1 sets C1 or PI, each party sets its CI value to be AI, BI, XOR, UI, XOR, VI. Okay, again, this makes no sense until you look at the algebra. So let's look at the algebra now of what happened here. Let's look at what C1, XOR, C2 is. Okay, C1, we said, equals A1, B1, XOR U1, XOR V1. Fine. That's okay. Okay, so what here is okay? C1 is A1, B1, XOR U1, V1. And C2 is exactly the same, but with the two values. So it's A2, B2, XOR U2, V2. U2, XOR V2. Now you can just rearrange the orders, and you get that uh, we know that U1... Where is it? We know that V1 XOR U2 equals A2 B1. So you can just take the V1 and the U2 and write A2 B1. You can take the U and you can take the U1 and the V2 and write A1 V2, and you get that they've actually computed uh, the, the values that they need. So they now have C1, A1, and B1, and C2, A2, and B2, that they have this magic relation between them. Okay, if you're pulling your hair out right now. I understand, because if I was sitting there, I'd be pulling my hair out as well. Uh, all you have to really do to understand this is just take a piece of paper and run it through by yourself, and you'll see that everything is, is it's, the, everything works. It just works. It's one of those protocols that it's, there isn't that much intuition to it. It just, it's just magic. Okay? There is no generalization. I don't know, but Ivan probably would. If there's a generalization to more multiplications, if you want to multiply, like to do the multiplication of uh, what, like three values together, the other generalizations of this. If Ethan doesn't know, of, then it's probably likely that there is. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs>
There's no nice ways of doing it. Okay, this is a nice way. I, I, it's actually really incredible that it works. It's really efficient. It's two OTs, and uh, and that's all you need. So with two OTs, you can you can do this. I want you to notice one other thing. There are two OTs where actually the inputs are just random. So each party chooses. We wrote it as they P1 chooses M0, M1, and P2 chooses A2. But actually they're just random values, and if they didn't actually choose them, but there was some artifact of a protocol, that would also be fine. So if you had a random OT protocol, that would be fine for this purpose. Okay, now why, why do I want to, what, what am I generating these, these triples for? As I said, Claudio and Ivan will use them very, very heavily in the protocols I'll talk about. So you'll meet them again a lot of the next couple of days. But what we'll show you now is that we can actually use these to uh, compute AND, to compute an AND. Okay, so if I have a multiplication triple, I can compute an AND gate very efficiently. Okay, so we have this multiplication triple. We have A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2, and we want to compute an AND. Now, if you thought the previous one was magic, then this one is even worse. Uh, P1 will send P2, X1. So, so now they have actual inputs. Okay, so P1 has X1 and Y1. P2 has X2 and Y2. These are their shares on the input wires. So X1, X2, X2 is the X value, is the actual value on one of the input wires. Y1, X1, Y2 is Y, it's the input, actual input on the other, on the other wire, but they're short, the share between the two wires, that's part of GMW. So now, uh, P1, P1 sends to P2 the two following values, D1, which is X1, X or A1, and E1, which is Y1, X or B1. So he masks, P1 masks its input <coughs> shares with the A1 and B1 values. Since they're random, that's fine. And he sends them to P2. P2 doesn't learn anything because they're just they're masked by random values. Now P2 does exactly the same thing. P2 sends back to P1 D2, which is X2, X or E2, uh, X or A2, and E2, which is Y2, X or B2. Okay. Once again, they're masked by random values, so no one learns anything. But based on these values, we'll be able to compute the AND because of the correlation that we know that exists between A, B, and C. In particular, P1 and P2 will locally compute their D, XOR of the D and E values. Now each hold D and E, and then P2 will output Z1 equals DB1 XOR EA1 XOR C1 XOR DE, and P2 will output Z2, which is constructed in a similar way. <coughs> and if you just look at that, it's clear why it works or not. So I'm going to have to do this on the board. I'm not sure if you all have uh, binoculars. But uh, there is no other way to show that this actually works. And it's actually just provided that. So, what I've already done is the wireless is KMC. Not these folks can look at the internet while I talk. Okay. So, uh, let's just write it out. There isn't any other way of doing it. We want to show that Z1, X, or Z2 equals what we want it to be. So, I try and write B. The marker isn't very good. Z1, XOR, Z2 equals, we have the XOR of all these values, so I can see we have DB1 and DB2, so we get DB1 XOR B2, which is just D times B, so it's D times B, we get that there, and likely, likewise XOR E times A, XOR C, XOR uh, DE, okay, so they're just combined together the A1 XOR A2, the C1 XOR C2, and the B1 and the B1 XOR B2. So I get this relation here, and uh, okay. So why does this help me? Now I need to go back to what D equals. D equals, if you look at what D, D is X1 XOR X2 XOR A. Okay, and likewise E is Y1 XOR Y2 XOR B. So let's write that out. That's so we get x. So x1 XOR2 x or x2 is just x. So to for short I'm going to write x. So this is x XOR A times B XOR Y XOR B XOR A. No, it's times A. Uh, XOR C XOR D E. And now if we uh, uh, D E have to also write. It. 
<laughs> okay, I don't have a choice. D E is um, X or A, Y or B. So now I get this is X B, so that equals X B or A B or Y A or A B or C or X Y. Sor XB, Sor AY, Sor AB. And now we have the magic that XP, XB appears here and here, that AB appears here and here, YA appears here and here, and C and AB appear here, but we know from the property of the correlation of C and AB that C equals A times B. So it also cancels out, and we're left only with x times y. Magic. <laughs> you can applaud. It's not my trick. It's Beaver's, but it's it's it's. So given a single multiplication triple, you can compute an AND gate by exchanging uh, two bits each. P1 sends two bits to B2, P2, and P2 sends two bits to P1. Now, why is this important? Because we can actually compute all the multiplication triples, which involve only two OTs, ahead of time. And now when we come to do GMW, what do we have to exchange? Two bits. Two bits for each gate is all we have to exchange, and we can compute the entire circuit. So obviously gate by gate. So it gives really, really, really efficient computation in online time. And computing the multiplication triples is not hard, it just involves two OTs, which when Benny did that yesterday, anyway, doing a single AND gate required two OTs. So it doesn't cost you any more, but now you can get really, really, really fast online time because for every gate, all you need to do is compute two, is send just two bits and do a local XOR operation. Okay, so if you're talking about app ramification, like making things truly fast, Reducing the bandwidth and reducing the online computation time is something which is uh, really very, very meaningful. Okay? So that's how we can speed up GMW really, really, really uh, 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 significantly. And again, tomorrow and on Wednesday, Claudio and Ivan will show you how you can build on this in order to prevent cheating, which, for example, would be changing the shares and doing all, all funny things. Essentially, in some sense, they show how to build multiplication triples that you cannot cheat on very efficiently. Fair way of presenting it, right? Yeah. All right. Now let's move on to garbled circuits and to Yao. That was GMW. So this is a conventional circuit. Okay. And if you want to compute the circuit, then uh, you uh, compute an AND and an OR, and you get the result at the end, and everyone's happy. And the garbled circuit, you uh, uh, have encryption keys instead. The keys look random, but if you have <coughs> one key on every input wire, you can still compute the output. Uh, this is the way a garbled gate looks. You have four boxes or four encryptions. Uh, this is an AND gate, so you have uh, um, one blue key, which is the one value, and three green keys, which are the... Uh, they look yellow, right? Yeah, on my computer they look green. Uh, um, Maybe it's not plugged in properly. Not this. Uh, and you have three uh, zero values, and then given one, one of each of the correct input uh, keys, you can compute the output key. Okay, so that's what you see here. You have the green key A and the blue key D. So that means, or yellow, so yellow. So that means you can do this one. Okay, so you're able to compute this value. Uh, how do we formalize garbling schemes? This is the approach taken by uh, a paper on, uh, uh, by Villare, Wang, and Rogo Wei. They give a certain definition. There's another definition uh, that's called randomized encoding. The basic idea is that a garbling scheme, you can abstract out a garbling scheme as something that gives you certain functionality. So what's the functionality? We have a garbling... Uh, um, function, which will output capital F, E, and D. What are capital F, E, and D? Capital F is something which enables you, which is the, uh, uh, um, the garbled circuit to compute, essentially. E is the uh, encoding of the, 
of the input values. So you have to encode input values into something that will enable you to decrypt the circuit. And D is the um, no, what? It's this thing E and D. Yeah, but if I'm thinking, so let's just think about Yao for a second. I think I just Yao, so F will be the actual garbled circuit. E will be the uh, ah, E will be the pairs of the values on the input wires, and D will be a single value on the input wire, right? Oh, the translation tables. D will be sorry, yeah, right. D will be the translation tables to go to get the output. Um, okay, so so. If you're thinking Yao, then, then you have that F is the garbled circuit, E is the, are the values on the input wires, and D are the, val are, are the translation tables which Benny showed you yesterday, how you get from the, the garbled values on the output wires to the actual output bits. But in general, you can think of an abstraction, which can, and, and you can implement this in, in, in possibly different ways. This has advantages uh, if you want to uh, prove, for example, a protocol to be secure using a generic garbled circuit that meets this definition, and if you come up with a new way which is more optimized, let's say a better way of constructing a garbled circuit, you don't have to completely reprove your entire protocol secure. So the garbled circuits are one component in a protocol. I want to prove it <coughs> secure once, and then I want to uh, construct better garbled circuits but not touch the proof of the protocol, because that's the uh, harder part to prove, and just I want to prove the garbled circuit itself. So you have the garbling, the initial garbling function, you have an encoding function, which now takes this, uh, uh, these encoding values and an actual input and gives you a pair, gives you values which actually enable you to evaluate the circuit. And you have the decoding which will enable you to get the output. Okay? And the correctness is that if everything is fine, then everything is fine. And the privacy says that if you've given only the garbled circuit, and you're given a set of keys that are related to a single set of inputs, uh, and you're getting the translation tables at the end, you're not able to learn anything except the single prescribed output. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about this, this which, what's the best definition. Is it this definition or the randomized encoding definition? I'm not <coughs> going to take any position. Okay, so... Um, the reason why it's important to show though is because now we're going to talk about optimizing garbled circuits and it is a very good idea to work with a definition of what's the security of garbled circuits and then afterwards you can plug that into anything else. So here's a list of uh, optimizations that have been carried out on garbled circuits that are very significant in, in the sense that if we don't have these optimizations then Yao will really be very inefficient. So, when today we say that Yao is efficient, it's because of a long, of a series of very, very uh, um, powerful optimizations that have been made to the construction that enable to be garbled efficiently and evaluated efficiently. If you do the naive thing, it will be much, much, much slower than what we can do today. So, what's in bold are the ones that we're going to do here, and what's uh, not, we're going to skip. So, we're going to skip two row reduction in flexor, but I be, believe that Abi uh, will cover actually both flexor and two row reduction, so uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, get that later on today. So the classic, the first, uh, uh, the classic way of doing Yao, uh, which, uh, um, which Ben introduced yesterday first, is to use encryption with an efficiently verifiable range, and that means you, for each gate, you use double encryption, and, uh, and you have some, uh, some redundancy in the encryption so that when you decrypt, you can check if, de if you've decrypted correctly. Okay, you could do this using very uh, strong authenticated <coughs> encryption, but you can also simply just encrypt also uh, uh, a long string of zeros, and if you're using a pseudorandom function to encrypt, then uh, if, if you're not encrypt, decrypting the correct row, the probability that you'll get this long series of zeros is negligible, and so you'll be able to detect when you've decrypted correctly. And the problem is that, uh, so that's what we call efficiently ver verifiable range. The problem with this is that you need to decrypt multiple entries until the decryption succeeds. And that means that uh, <coughs> um, on average, the expected number of decryptions is two and a half. Why two and a half? because it's either one, two, three, or four, and if you take the expectation of the probability one quarter each, 
it'll take you on average two and a half decryptions per gate or two and a half rows and each row is a double encryption so it actually takes you five decryptions per gate to compute to evaluate the circuit and it will take you eight encryptions per gate to garble. Uh, that's, uh, um, that's the cost of the naive construction and BMR when they did their multi-party uh, construction actually introduced it for a different reason they introduced a notion called point and permute which again Benny mentioned yesterday but I'll do it again where you actually have a public value we call a signal bit a public value that tells you which row you are supposed to be decrypting right now and uh, how does this work what you do is you simply allocate to in each wire you allocate a bit that tells you are the keys in order or in reverse order and there and it's a random bit and then I can actually tell you the, the, the bit that you, the, the, the key that you are actually holding in, as part of your actual decryption is zero. What does it mean that it's zero? It actually tells you nothing. It just means that the XOR between the signal bit and the real bit equals zero. But you actually don't know which you're holding because it's masked by a random bit each time. And then given that information, you're able to actually know exactly which row you're supposed to go and decrypt because you'll either have zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one, and you can go directly to the row that you were supposed to decrypt and that means that uh, that means you can only to decrypt a single row every time and we've now with this simple idea think about this is one very very simple idea we've reduced the decryption time to uh, 1 over 2.5 of what it was previously 2.5 and, and a third of what, we, what it was previously Okay, it's so a very, very significant optimization with something very simple. Another advantage is that you don't need to have redundancy in the encryption, so therefore your actual encryption itself will, can also be more efficient. Because if you want to encrypt a key and redundancy, you'll need two, op two block cipher operations, and now you get away with one. So in fact, previously you needed four encryptions per, uh, per, each, uh, um, per each row, and now you can get down to two. Okay, so it simplifies the output uh, decryption, and uh, and uh, and from so from now on, we'll denote by P of K to be the permutation bit of the PK. The second thing that we want to do is to reduce bandwidth. Why do we want to reduce bandwidth? It's turning out that because of, uh, for example, modern hardware that enables you to do AES operations very very quickly, the bottleneck in a lot of secure computation protocols has actually become the bandwidth. So sending four ciphertexts per gate is something that makes Yao expensive. Let's compare it to GMW. In GMW, okay, so we have to do the, uh, we have to prepare these multiplication triples, but that's the oblivious transfer, which using OT extension we can do very fast. It doesn't require uh, transmitting too much. We can also do it offline. In the online, you can actually just transmit two bits per gate. Whereas in Yao, we're transmitting four ciphertexts per gate. Each ciphertext is, say, 128 bits at the minimum. So we're, we're, we're transferring half a K per gate, which is a lot more than two bits, which is better. I'll, just, I'll talk about that at the end of this. Talk. So uh, the idea is as follows. Let's talk about how to, how to encrypt. Uh, so here's the description of the encryption function. Instead of encrypting, by the way, one, on, one after the other, because that's hard to parallelize, you simply XOR the output key, you apply the pseudorandom function to the input key, the left input key, along with the gate name, XOR it with the right input key, along with the gate name, and XOR that with the output key. By the way, the reason we include the gate name is because the same wire can go into many gates, and you want to make sure that you have different values masking in different gates. Okay, so this T is going to be the gate name, or it's a tweet, and you just make sure that you have different values in each gate. So this is uh, uh, the way you would encrypt. And the idea is that actually we can eliminate the first table entry by implicitly fixing it to be zero. Okay, so let me explain what I mean. Uh, classically, what you would think is that the way to compute a garbled circuit is to choose random values for all the wires. And now go and compute each gate. 
You now, in each gate, you now have two input, two keys on each input wire and two keys on the output wire, and now do the encryption to uh, map from the input wires to the output wires. That, that's fine. But we don't actually have to do, do work in that way. We don't actually have to choose all of the garbled values on the wires first and then do the encryption. We can allow the garbled values to actually be implicitly defined from the, uh, uh, from the garbling of the, of the gates. So I can have garbled keys on the input wires and allow them to implicitly define the keys on the output wires, or at least one of them. And that's what we do here. So uh, the first table entry is going to be eliminated by fixing it to be zero. You know, instead of having this relation where k0 will equal, uh, well, k0 will be masked by these, we'll just have k0 equal that. Okay, so if you look here, I'm going to let the app, not k0, it's k0, k output. I'm going to let one of the output keys simply be the XOR of the pseudorandom function on the left key, right key, um, with the permutation bit being zero. So the signal bit is zero, I know it's the both zeros, and I'm just going to define that the appropriate output key might be the zero key or the one key, depending on what the permutation bits are, what the signal bits are. I'm going to define that simply to be the XOR of those. And then I'm going to write the remaining three entries in the same way. So the first entry beforehand was K O XOR these things. Now I'm going to let K or equal these two, which means the XOR is going to be zero, so there's no point writing it down. And when you come to compute the gate, you have the signal bits. If you have signal bits zero, zero, you won't actually try to decrypt anything. You'll simply compute the pseudorandom function on the left key and the right key and take the XOR to be the output key. And if you have any other three, you'll decrypt in the regular way. Okay, a very simple idea, uh, very, very uh, powerful, because it now reduces the bandwidth by 25% without adding any computational overhead. The computational overhead is exactly the same. Yeah. And you can also still do it parallelly, right? You can do each gate in parallel. Uh, you, well, you can't, you can do, you can't do, uh, you can do on a level you can do in parallel, but you can no longer do uh, gates, like if I have a gate which the wire from this gate goes into this gate, I can't do them in parallel because I don't know the value on this wire until I've done this gate. So it does reduce the, possibi the, the possibil possibility to parallelize completely. Uh, the next optimization, which is arguably the most uh, um, most dramatic, so the most dramatic optimization is called freak sort. Until now, we knew that in GMW, XORs were for free and ANDs required interaction, but in now you had to pay for every single gate. To understand why that's important, the AES function, which everybody likes to talk about, <coughs> has 33,000 gates, but only about 7,000 AND gates. So the vast majority of those gates are actually XOR gates. And XOR gates, and, and if we're paying for all the gates, that's, that means it's very expensive. If we make the XOR gates for free, we'll reduce the cost of computing and transmitting the circuit from 33,000 to 7,000, which is a very, very big improvement. It's not true for all functions. So if you look at DES, for example, DES has many more AND gates than XOR gates. If you look at uh, addition, then it's similar. So it does depend very much on what you're computing. Uh, but again, it also has a lot to do with how you want to optimize the circuit that you're building. OK. So here's a different encryption function. Instead of encrypting by applying a pseudorandom function to the left key and to the right key separately and XORing them together, uh, you're going to <coughs> hash the left key and the right key and the gate number once and then XOR that with the output key. So now you're reducing from two encryptions to a single hash function. Is this a good idea? Well, it depends very much on the cost of encryption versus hash hashing. It actually turns out that uh, AES, at least in hardware, is much, much faster than SHA. So 
you want to use, we'll see another way to do it soon, but in 2008 this made sense, today you wouldn't want to actually do that. Well, we don't have hardware implementations of both. We have uh, AESNI. You can actually use AESNI to speed up SHA. There, it is also possible, but I don't, we haven't seen any, we haven't seen that, uh, how do you utilize that in a way that would be competitive. It's just the facts of the world. We do have AESNI, we don't have, uh, we don't have SHA and I. The hash functions are changing too often to, for anybody to put them in hardware. Okay, so the idea of freak sort is instead of choosing, uh, let's think about it. Beforehand, we have we chose each uh, the garbled values on each wire to be random values independent of each other. But actually, the evaluator only learns a single wire, a single value on each wire. So if the two values on each wire were correlated in some fixed way, it wouldn't necessarily matter. Because the evaluator still only sees a single wire, a single value on each wire, so it would never learn the correlation. And that's the idea behind the freak saw. We're going to, to choose a fixed difference R and make the XOR of the, the values, the keys on each wire, be that fixed value R. Okay, so again, each wire has two garbled values or two keys. Beforehand, they were just independent. <coughs> or these computation dependent, they were independent random values. Now we're going to make them that the that one is random and the other is just that value XOR the fixed dif difference R. Okay, so it's really uh, it's, uh, the XOR of every pair of keys on every garbled wire equals R. Why do I want to do that? Because now if I have XOR gates, all I need to do is compute just compute the XOR of the keys that I'm given. And everything will work out. And how do we see that? Um, let's see why it works. If I'm given, so we have the low, lowercase and uppercase here. Lowercase is, for example, the zero key, and uppercase is the one key. So if I'm given two lowercase keys, um, then actually this equals R, capital R, XOR, XOR, capital R, XOR, B, because the R is cancelled out. That equals the capital A or capital B, which is exactly what you want in an XOR gate. In an XOR gate, 0 and 0 should equal 1 and 1. They should equal the same. And if I have a capital C, which means I have the 1 value, so that's equal to little c x or r, because that's going to be the 1 value, which is A x or B x or r, which is exactly the same if I have this R can go with the B or can go with the A, a it's exactly the same as having A X or capital B or capital A X or little b. So if you have a 0, 1 in either direction, you'll get the same value. So now I can compute X, I can garble an XOR for free. It's implicit. I don't even have to give you any gates. I have zero encryptions in, a, in an XOR gate. And I also have uh, and computing the output wire from that input gate is for free. Well, it's not free, it's an XOR, but XOR is relatively free. Okay, so what that means is that now uh, I choose, again, all the garbled, garbled values on the input wires, and I start now to compute, to, to compute the circle, and I have an AND gate or some other type of gate. I compute the encryptions, I possibly do the garbled row reduction we saw a moment ago, and I get the values on the output wires, and when I get to an XOR gate, I just take the value on the wire afterwards to be the XOR of the values on the input wires, and, and I go on, so on and so forth. Once again, I move through this uh, limits the uh, uh, parallelization capabilities, but it, uh, it's not something which is, is problematic. It's, it's definitely worthwhile. The intu in, in, uh, intuitively, the reason why this is secure is because the evaluator, evaluator only knows one key per wire, so he never actually learns that delta, that R. He never actually learns the fixed difference between them. The problem is that this actually does require a stronger assumption on the functions that we're using. So, for example, it requires that H is a model is a random oracle. You don't actually have to do it as a random oracle. You can also... Uh, uh, have a funny, non-standard, correlation-robust circularity assumption, or may possibly a, some strange type of related key assumption. The problem is that what you actually have is you have this relation uh, of the XOR 
on the input to encryption and on the output of encryption, which, which generates a type of circularity. So you can't actually prove this secure under a standard assumption of pseudorandom functions. In general, in, a, in the race, in the arms race to be more efficient, uh, the secure computation world has thrown out any respect for assumptions. Uh, we don't care as long as it's faster, we'll use the most crappy assumption in the world. Uh, at some stage, I think this has to stop. Uh, so some things are reasonable. So here, I guess it's random oracle, and random oracle everyone uses in practice anyway, so maybe that's not so bad. Forget funny circularity, correlation, robust, related key, just say random oracle. There are other assumptions that I think maybe we, do, we, are going, we should try to somehow see if we can uh, uh, not, uh, not actually, uh, uh, actually go back to something more standard. So what do you, what, what, what's the bad assumption? Fixed key AES, I think, is a bad assumption. Fixed key? That AES is an ideal permutation? Is it ideal cipher, yeah. yeah. I think it's a bad assumption. If you ask block cipher people, they'll tell you that as well. AES actually doesn't behave nicely for related keys. But if, if someone were to find a, an ideal permutation attack against AES, that would be like a, <coughs> that would be a devastating attack, right? Yeah, but let me ask you another question. <laughs> Would you, if you're consulting for a company, would you tell them to use fixed key AES to encrypt the database? Uh, no. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> and, no one, and no one would. It's different. Why? If you're using it in practice, it's different. You're not writing a paper, you're actually using this in practice. So it is different. You know why it's different? Because using fixed key AES to encrypt your database is not going to save you that much time. So it's not that important. And therefore, you're not going to recommend it. It's like for CCA encryption, why are you going to tolerate a random oracle? Because if you tell someone you need to use four, four, time, four more servers, uh, sorry, four times the number of servers to use Kramer Shoop instead of RSA or EP, then they're not going to do it. And here it's costing you a lot, lot, lot more. And therefore you're willing to do it. What I'm saying is an important research goal is to make it not cost so much more. And if it then doesn't cost so much more, then you won't have to have to tell people to use such a crappy assumption. So you're right, in the current situation where it's going to cost a huge amount more, this will not be reasonable to do. Yeah, in practice, I think that the fixed key versus like uh, changing the key, I don't think it's that, that, I don't think that's a bottleneck now. It's not such a, it's not such a bottleneck. And in fact, I'm working on that, but we can talk about it in a break. Uh, so the, uh, the, next, uh, the next step for optimizing is so instead of using a hash function, let's, let's garble via AES. Let's use the AES function. And why do we want to use AES, which is a block cipher, instead of a hash function? Because, as we mentioned, we have hardware in, in most modern uh, uh, processors, and we can use that hardware to actually uh, do things much more efficiently. So, uh, Abby's, uh, Abby's uh, recommendation was to do AES in the following way, to take to use 256-bit AES, so just, to, just note that AES can be used for three key sizes, 128, 192, and 256, but the block size is always 128. Okay, so what Abby suggested was to take, uh, to use AES 256, but to make the key be combined from the XOR of two, the two keys, come, not the XOR, the concatenation of the two keys coming out of the wires going into the gate. So I have two 128-bit keys, I'll concatenate them to get 256 bits, and then I'll use that in AES to encrypt the output wire. Now, this requires a uh, um, expensive AES key schedule per gate, because the key schedule in AES is actually quite heavy, and it also requires assuming a related key assumption, which is actually not great for AES, although I have to admit that it's not so bad because the related key attacks that are in AES are related key attacks where the attacker has strong uh, influence over what the relation will be, and here the attacker doesn't have any influence <coughs> over it. But nevertheless, it, once again, it's no longer a standard uh, pseudo-random permutation assumption. But this is one way of doing it, and it's possible to actually uh, get that key schedule to be more efficient, but that's another issue. What's now become the uh, gold standard is uh, the fixed AES key assumption, which was used by Bellare, Wang, Kelvidi, and Rogaway, which is to choose the fixed key X and run the AES key schedule once, and now use AES with that fixed key 
in this funny way which is defined by in order to encrypt you have an input key k and you compute AES with a fixed key on that key k you, and you XOR it again with k where this k is uh, a function of the two inputs that are coming from the two wires. Uh, this is, looks very weird but you can prove it under what's called an ideal cipher assumption which basically means that for every single key for a AES uh, every different key defines a completely random uh, uh, permutation. The ideal cipher assumption is considerably more, uh, considerably stronger, I guess, than a random oracle assumption. Not that anybody knows how to attack it, but this is what people are using now. Uh, the good thing about this is you can combine it with uh, free XOR and free reduction. If you want to know why this is so significant, because it's because in AES, if you have a fixed key and the key schedule has already been run, then you can actually do AES operations at the rate of about 0.7 cycles per byte on uh, modern processors. <coughs> so you're doing 16 bytes, so you have about 10 cycles to compute uh, to, to compute a single uh, to evaluate a single gate. And uh, uh, when you want to do garbling, you have to do four operations. So this A and ASNI chip actually enables you to do pipelining. So the cost of doing one or four encryptions is actually not very different at all. It's almost the same cost. So we're talking about very, very few cycles in order to compute an entire gate. And in Yao, when you have to garble a large number of gates, this is uh, very, 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 very significant. So everybody loves this uh, assumption, everybody loves this uh, uh, construction, even though it requires assuming very non-standard non things about AES, it enables you to get incredible uh, speeds. Uh, another optimization is called half gates, and I'm not going to talk about it very much. I think Abi is going to. All I want to say is this is a new work which is uh, will appear at Euro this upcoming Eurocrypt, which is how to do uh, garbled row reduction not from 4 to 3 but from 4 to 2. Now Abby this afternoon is going to show how you can go from 4 to 2 but in a way that is not compatible with FreakSor. So you can reduce the size of gates from, from 4 ciphertext to 2 ciphertext then you have to give up on FreakSor and this work will enable you to go from 4 to 2 and not give up on FreakSor. Okay? So as I said this uh, field is moving really 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 fast Every year, uh, new results, surprising results, surprising optimizations are coming out, and uh, and this has huge ramifications for the cost of actually doing this interpretation. The, the assumption that this is the same, it's it's no more than FreakSor. It does require the FreakSor assumptions, so you need uh, funny circularity related key correlation robust blah blah blah. Random Oracle, <laughs> Ideal Cipher. If you're assuming an Ideal Cipher on AES, then you're done. Because Ideal Cipher includes all the crappy assumptions you can want in the world. Okay? But again, nobody knows any attacks, and it does give you performance that otherwise we could only dream of. Okay. So that's what I have to say about uh, uh, Yao. And I, I do want to stress again that this long series of, of optimizations has a huge ramification on the cost. If you went back to what we were thinking about doing 10 years ago, it's not just that computers have become faster, it's also that uh, we really are, have many improvements in the size of the, size of the circuit we're receiving, how to garble it, uh, that make huge ramifications, together obviously with the fact that computing uh, has improved and we can utilize special hardware like the AES chip, uh, and and understanding how the AES chip actually works and incorporating that into our constructions and utilizing that, using that understanding in order to get better garbling schemes, these things are all, uh, uh, have made, uh, made a huge difference. So just for example, this work <coughs> of using a fixed key AES, it's not just understanding that the key schedule in AES is expensive, it's also understanding that the AES and I chip enables you very, very powerful pipelining. So doing four encryptions is like essentially doing one encryption plus a little plus epsilon then using that in that specific way and implementing it, use, utilizing the pipeline gives you amazing performance. Okay, <coughs> so let's talk about co coming back to oblivious transfer. As we mentioned, oblivious transfer is needed for 
uh, a number of things it's needed for both for Yao and for GMW. Claudio will need it for Tiny OT, and Ivan couldn't care less because he doesn't need it for Speaks. But he still likes OT, I think. Uh, so the bad news, as Benny mentioned, is there's no black box reduction from OT to one-way functions. You can't use symmetric encryption only. And therefore, you have to use exponentiations. And exponentiations are expensive, even if you're only doing uh, a few, and even if each one only costs a couple of hundred microseconds, it still means that you won't get much more than about 1,000 OTs per second. 1,000 OTs per second may be OK, but what if I want to run GMW on a 1.3 billion, circuit, a billion uh, a gate circuit? And 1.3 billion AND gates. Okay, then doing 1,000 OTs per second is not going to make me very happy. So, uh, so the good news is that you can actually do oblivious transfers, do a small number of base OTs and extend it. That's what Benny mentioned. So you have these real OTs or base OTs, and then you somehow stretch them and, and are able to get a huge number of other OTs, like hybrid encryption with public key. You, can, you encrypt a single symmetric key and then encrypt a long message with a symmetric key. It's exactly the same idea here with the OT extension. You do a small number of expensive operations and then just cheap operations for everything else. Okay. So, uh, so Betty did this yesterday, so I'm not going to go. Uh, I'm not. Go I'm just going to run through it very quickly. We have the OT extension of uh, uh, Ishai et al. Uh, again, but I just want to mention, if you got lost in the OT extension, it's fine. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's almost impossible not to get lost in it. Because again, like the multiplication triples, uh, it's the sort of thing that just works. You have to just go through line by line and, and, and write it down on a piece of paper, and then you see that it actually works. It's, but it's, it's somewhat magic. Right? There are protocols out there that are not magic, that they have good intuition. Personally, may, maybe there is good intuition for this protocol. I don't have it. I can explain it, but you have good intuition? So Claudio has good intuition, he'll explain it to you tomorrow. I don't. I just see that it works. Uh, OK, so this is the OT extension of IKNP. They run, you run a number of base OTs. Um, and uh, one thing that yesterday, ben, the, the naive way of doing this, uh, we said, is you want to uh, have the, the receiver actually plays the sender in the oblivious transfers. And with really, really long strings. So we have these long, long columns. This would actually be a very bad idea. What you'd actually do, what you, what's actually much better to do is simply to do oblivious transfers on keys to a pseudorandom function or pseudorandom generator and then stretch the results that you get. So you're actually doing OT on, are you doing N OTs on 128 OTs using Benny's terminology, 128 million, doing 120 OTs on keys for AES. And then you extend those to a million bits by just doing, for example, AES and counting. Uh, then you have this random matrix, and you transpose it, and everyone's happy. OK. So how much does this cost? Uh, per OT, you have uh, uh, pseudorandom generation evaluations and hash evaluations. And this is, the, this is the pie chart, which actually, for me, was like uh, a huge surprise. Because as I mentioned to you earlier today, I grew up thinking that the cost of cryptographic protocols is the cryptographic operations, and that's all that matters. Benny uh, saw my punchline yesterday, so I'm very upset at him. But if you look at this graph, 42% of the time of the protocol went on matrix transpose, okay, which is just absurd. 42% of the protocol, it's not the hash function operations, it's not exponentiations, it's not pseudorand, it's not running AES. It's doing matrix transpose. I have this long matrix. I have this. I have 128 long strings. It's taking a bit from each string, and that's because we have a huge number of cache misses. So reading from memory takes longer than running AES. Okay, and uh, this is uh, again the time distribution for doing 10 million OTs, which took 21 seconds. So doing 10 million OTs in, is what takes 21 seconds in the original protocol. And this one I'm going to describe now is some of the optimizations that we did uh, in a work two years ago at ACMCCS in making this uh, in this faster. Okay, so the non-crypto part was actually taking the mo taking the most amount of time, and uh, the reason is because of the cache misses. So Eklund in 1970 something wanted to do matrix transpose on magnetic tape. Now magnetic tape is very expensive uh, to go back and forth, so cache misses are really expensive. 
So he came up with a way of doing it that would not require moving so much back and forth on the, on, on the magnetic tape. Or in today's modern terms, modern algorithmic terms, a ca what's called a cache-aware algorithm. And if you're not familiar, by the way, with cache-aware algorithms, uh, it's worthwhile reading about them. For sorting today is much, much faster using cache-aware sorting than quick sort. Okay, so the, uh, because of the uh, amount of time it takes to read from memory versus cache, you want to try and do as many operations locally. If you do naive uh, matrix multiplication, by just reversing the order of the summation and making it cache aware, it becomes 10 times faster just by reversing the order of the summation. Okay, so it's really impressive stuff, and I encourage everybody to look at it. Um, so the way it works is instead of taking the entire first row to make the first column, you, you work locally. So you first you swap these, 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 and these, and then after you swap this and this, and, and you do these, uh, and you go bigger and bigger, and what happens is that it becomes uh, much, much less, and we actually, uh, it reduces, the transposition became 10 times faster. Okay? So out of 21 seconds, if 40% was that, then that's 8 seconds. Instead of 8 seconds, it took 0.8 seconds. So we've now reduced by about 30% the cost of the protocol simply by changing the way we do the matrix transpose. Uh, what's the lesson from that? The lesson from that is don't think only about crypto. If you want fast protocols, you're going to have to take into account other effects as well and other elements as well. This is also related to what I talked about AESNI. You have to understand systems, algorithms, and crypto altogether. Another thing that we want is we don't want to work on these massive matrices. Okay, so we had the, the original protocol has these, let's say I want to do 1.3 billion oblivious transfers. So what I'm going to do now is transfer this, one, this massive matrix 1.3 billion and transpose it. Even if I try to transpose that uh, uh, quickly, it's going to be very, very expensive to do. But in <coughs> fact, if you look at the protocol, it's possible to just work one block at a time. So actually to transfer small blocks of 128 by 128, transpose that, do the OTs and continue uh, in that way, uh, that just requires looking at the protocol and seeing how you can do it. Okay, so what we end up getting is that uh, this is already a significant improvement. But one thing that you can notice, and if you can see it properly, if you're using Yao, then you uh, need to uh, do oblivious transfer on, on keys, which are 80 or 128 bits long. If you're doing GMW, you actually only want to use the oblivious transfer to generate multiplication triples. And the last message of this, uh, uh, this oblivious transfer requires applying a hash, a la hash function and XORing it with the value. And, and so you have this value up here as well. And actually you're wasting a lot when you're doing GMW. So, as opposed to using CODTC, you could also use PRS. Yeah, the best PRG today is to do AES and count number. That's just going to be the best PRG. Um, Okay, so what we want to do is we want to uh, um, save on the communication. Now, one thing that you can see if you look at the original <coughs> protocol is that you have these pair of seeds. You have these pair of seeds, and then you send a pair of values that uh, essentially you mask the two columns of the matrix. Remember, we have, we have this matrix. We have a, a <coughs> column, and we have either the column or the column X or... Uh, the, the choice bits of the receiver. The first observation is, just like we did with the four to three row reduction, why do I need to choose the column explicitly? Why can't I make it be implicit, the implicit result of what I already had? So instead of defining T, instead of defining this U value that I'm going to send to be this pseudorandom generator X or the T, I'm just going to define T to be that pseudorandom generated value. I don't have to transmit it. So now instead of sending two values, uh, two values for each uh, uh, for each block, I can send a single one. Or say, stated differently, beforehand in order to oblivious transfer 1.3 billion long, I actually had to send two strings each each of length 1.3 billion for each one. Now I have to send one. So this tiny observation about how the protocol works, I've reduced the communication complexity to a half. The second thing where, that we, we note is that 
The Believer's transfer we're using is not actually necessarily a regular one, neither in Yao nor in GMW. In Yao, we know that the keys on the input wires are going to be correlated, if I'm using FreakSor. If you're using FreakSor, then we have one random value, and the other one is an XOR of that with the fixed difference. And if I'm doing GMW and I want to generate these multiplication tuples, triples, then it's, they're just completely random values. So it's like a pure random OT. Using that, that understanding, we can actually uh, optimize further. So in, 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 for correlated OT, instead of setting two values here at the end to encrypt, again, with the oblivious transfer, I hash I have this I have this row and in the, in the matrix and I either I hash that or that X or S instead of def instead of hashing them both and, and masking the results with the two inputs that I have I just take the first input to equal the hash of the row itself and the second input I do uh, I, I do the row X or S and I ha and then I do X or that with the value so again, I make the first key be implicitly defined by the oblivious transfer extension. And now I have to only, again, I, I've reduced my transmission by another half. Uh, for random OT, I don't even have to transmit anything at all. I can simply define the result of uh, both bits to be the hashes of the, of the, of the possible rows. So it's completely implicit. We have these rows, right? We have in this OT extension, uh, there are two, two possible values for the rows, and the sender has them both, and the receiver has one of them. So instead of transmitting anything, just hash the row that you have as a receiver and take that bit, take those, take that bit to be the result. And likewise, the sender hash both of them and take both of those bits. They're random; we have no control over them. But when we constructed the multiplication triples, we didn't need to have any control over them. Okay, so if we look at what happens. The initial runtime was 21 seconds on a LAN for uh, um, a million, for 10 million of English transfers, and 30.7 on, uh, on Wi-Fi because of the bandwidth. The first, by doing an efficient matrix transposition, actually on the uh, Wi-Fi didn't make much of a difference because the communication was the bottleneck, but on the LAN we went down from 20.6 to 14.4 seconds just by doing efficient matrix transposition. By generating the matrix from the seeds instead of sending both values, actually we only got very mild improvement. So both in the LAN and the, wi uh, and the uh, Wi-Fi went down only a little bit, and the reason is that although we reduced by half the message going in one way, the message coming back hadn't been reduced. So we didn't actually, we reduced the communication in one direction, but not in the other, so the other the communication in the other direction was still the bottleneck. So we didn't actually get much of an improvement. But once we uh, added also the implicit uh, um, communication in the other direction by the correlated oblivious transfer, we only need to send half the, half the values, we now cut by half the communication in both directions, and it went down from 29.4 to 14.4 in the on the Wi-Fi. Okay, and for random OT it was slightly less. Here you don't need any message at the end, but you still have a message going in the first direction. Okay, the bottom the and and also by doing as we said, you can work in parallel instead of working on a, on a uh, large matrix. When you're in uh, the land, then this further improves the, the time, but not with the Wi-Fi. With the Wi-Fi, the communication is the bottleneck. So what we get is that on a, on the Wi-Fi went down from 30 seconds to 14 seconds. On a land, they went down from 20.6 to 2.6. Let's say it's a 10, 10 times speed up. So now we can do 210 million oblivious transfers. Sorry, 100 million oblivious transfers in 21 seconds. Sorry, what, I forgot. What is 2 p and 4 p? Two threads and four threads. We can parallelize it. So this, so what you have is a, an almost 10 times speed up, and now you do 100 million oblivious transfers in 21 seconds which I think if you do the computation is like 21 microseconds per oblivious transfer. That's fast. 21 or 2.1, I'm not sure. Um, okay, I have 10 minutes left. So what should you use? Yao or GMW if you want to do semi arts computation? So for Yao, these are Thomas's slides, so uh, 
I'll try to do justice. How do you eat an apple? Bite by bite. That's how you eat an apple. So Yao has a constant number of rounds, and I guess each round is a bite. So you evaluate a garbled gate, and this requires symmetric crypto each way. But how do you eat an orange? Well, you can peel first. You have to first you uh, peel the entire orange. That's almost all the effort, and the rest is now eating it, which is easy to do. You don't have to do any more work with an apple. You have to work at every single bite. So in the hour, you have to work for every uh, for every bite. And with GMW, you can actually pre-process and do this all in the offline phase. So you can pre-compute all these multiplication triples for each and uh, using these two OTs that we talked about. And then in the online phase, you just sem simply send two bits in each direction for each AND gate. So the online now becomes very, very fast. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention that in this last crypto, crypto 2014, uh, there were two papers, one by myself and Ben River, and one by Jonathan Katz and others, which actually shows that you can also do pre-processing for Yao. So this is no longer actually true, but still the online time for Yao is more expensive than, than for GMW. Okay, so with both Yao and GMW, we get Freaksor now. With both Yao, with Yao, uh, you need symmetric crypto in the online phase, whereas with GMW, you don't. In terms of communication, Yao requires more for gates. And for Yao, you have a, sh a few number of rounds, whereas for GMW, you have many rounds, depending on the depth of the circuit. Okay, and per wire in GMW in the online phase, it's, it's two bits only, and for Yao, it's actually uh, it's actually many. Okay, so the question is, do we want a gate? Do we want a circuit with a small number of gates or a low depth? And it exactly depends on what we're trying to do. So we can look at circuits that have low low number of a small number of AND gates, and that will be excellent for Yao, even if we have a very very <coughs> deep circuit. Because Yao doesn't care how deep the circuit is. But for GMW, we want something with a small number of depth, even if you have many more ANDs. Because in GMW, each AND is two bits. Who cares? So I'm happy to have more AND if I can have low depth. So depending on the circuit, you may want to do, actually have different, uh, depending on the circuit, you may actually want to have a diff, take a different type of protocol. Or say the other direction, depending on the protocol you want to use, you may actually also want to take a different type of circuit. So in circuit addition, for example, it's possible to take to have a circuit which has, uh, has a smaller number of AND gates, but has more depth. Okay, and there, these are two examples. The first one is a circuit that has L AND gates and L depth. And the second one is a circuit which has L plus 1.25 L log L gate, so it has, uh, I guess, uh, over, it's more than two and a half times the size of the first one, but its AND depth is only log, log, uh, uh, log L gates. So it can reduce the number, of the reduce the depth by increasing, say, by approximately three times the number of AND gates. If I want to run Yao, I want to take the first gate, the first circuit. If I want to run uh, um, GMW, I want to take the second circuit. And in fact, this is true of a number of problems, and here is uh, a whole uh, a series of examples. Um, so for adding, you have these two possible possibilities uh, for multiplication. Also for multiplication, you can have two L squared gates, AND gates, with depth uh, or order of L, or you can have more AND gates and only log depth. For comparison, Where's comparison? Oh, okay. yeah, for comparison, again you can have L AND gates and depth L, or you can have that three L AND gates and only log depth. Okay, and this has a lot to do with how you want to build your uh, your circuit. And if you actually want to, so there are two two challenges in 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 this game with the circuits. One challenge is that we would like secure mutation to be accessible. So we'd like to have automatic compilers that you can write C code and then compile that into, uh, into Boolean circuits automatically. And, and uh, there are works that do this. Uh, Abi, Abi uh, has what you, you, you have a compiler, right? So Abi has a very good compiler which, which does this. So automatically you can take C code and get Boolean circuits. There are other compilers out there as well. Iran, I think, has a better one. Iran has a better one. Iran, who has a better one than you? No one? 
<laughs> uh, there's still many reference that are pointing at everyone else. However, if you actually uh, have a very specific circuit that you want to compute, there seems to be no doubt, at least in my mind, that if you sit uh, and try really hard to work on it, you can do something better, which is actually what Thomas has done it over here. So, for example, for comparison, if you look at the circuit for comparison that appears on Bristol's website, it has, a, has 150 amps. By using Thomas's uh, method, you can actually reduce that down to a much, much smaller circuit. And I have f five minutes left, and I want to show you, uh, show you how to do that, because it also um, introduced something new, which are Yao circuits that have uh, gates that have more than two inputs. So, let's say I want to do comparison. <laughs> So the idea for doing comparison is I'm going to work bit by bit. So I want to compare to uh, say 32-bit inputs, uh, and I'm going to construct uh, a two-bit comparator, which I'll call less than, which will take the two bits, the two least significant bits that are coming in, and will take uh, so this will be the x1 and y1, and then uh, this will be x2 and y2. And this will be C1, which is the carry from the previous previous time. Now, what, is, what does it mean that I'm comparing on and do less than? It means I'm going to say the following. If x1 is less than y1, I'm going to say if x is less than y, then I want the output to be 1. Okay? So if x1 is less than y1, I want to have the output here be 1, because it could be that everything else is the same. Now I get to here, I have, I have something which came in here which is either 0 or 1. It's 1 if x1 was less than y1, it's a 0 otherwise. And now I want to say the following thing. If x2 is less than y2, then forget what I had. If x2 is less than y2, I don't care what I had beforehand because this is the more significant bit. Otherwise, if x2 equals y2, then I want to take, I want to take that bit. Okay, so if x2 equals y2, I want to take the same carry bit I had beforehand. Otherwise, if x2 is less than y2, I want to say less than. If x2 is greater than y2, I want to say not less than. Now I want to build a gate that will do this. Okay, this sounds like a, a, a complex function, but we have this wonderful tool that we all learned in discrete math many years ago, which is called the truth table. So let's just construct, construct a truth table. Let's not, not think. Thinking is not helping. Okay, so I want to write x, i, Y, I, and C, I, C, I being the carry, the carry bit. And I want to just write my truth table. <coughs> and now I want to say the following thing. Remember, I said that if X, I equals Y, I then take the carry bit. <coughs> so I'm going to write here 0 and 0. And I'm going to write, sorry, 0 and 0 here. Sorry, I'm messing it up. Because xi equals y. And here I'm going to write here. Sorry. I messed it up. So I'm going to write 0 and 1, 0 and 1 here. Because that's if xi equals y, I take the carry bit, I'm going to write 0 and 1 here. Now, otherwise, here we have that xi is less than yi. Okay, because 0 is less than 1. So I'm going to write 1 and 1, and here I have that xi is greater than yi, so I'm going to write 0 and 0. And this will be the output of the gate, the output of the gate, which will go to the next, to the next level. Uh, level. Yao doesn't care, also GMW by the way, doesn't care, doesn't require the gate to have two inputs and one output. You can construct a garbled, ta garbled table also for uh, a, a, a um, a gate that has three inputs. We'll now have eight entries. I'll use Garbled Row Reduction, I'll get seven entries. But instead of having 150 AND gates, which is what I have using, for example, the circuit of Bristol, I now have, for a 32-bit 32 32 comparison, I now have 32 gates. Now, if I had 150 AND gates, that would be 450 ciphertexts. I now have 32 gates of, of, of seven, which is 210. So I've reduced the number of the bandwidth by less than a half. And when I want to compute, because I have the permutation bit, I know exactly which row to go to straight away. 
So instead of requiring 150 decryptions, I require only 32 decryptions. That's a fifth of the time. So this requires, you know, going and uh, uh, you know, manually uh, uh, looking at the function I want to compute. And if I, let's say I want to do a sorting network, and I need to run 10 million comparisons, then doing this versus doing something naive, which I got from a compiler, would be much, much, much better, uh, a much better strategy. In summary, uh, we saw that uh, um, I'm not sure what I saw there. Uh, that we can gobble circuits with freak sores, that we have, and we have a small number of fixed AES evaluations per uh, per uh, um, per gate. Using half gates, we can even ha have only two ciphertexts, so we get low um, bandwidth. The OT extensions can be made very, very, very fast. This is for se semi-honest adversaries, for malicious adversaries. Claudio, I'm sure, will talk about it tomorrow. And Gilad on Thursday will present the result in the upcoming uh, Eurocrypt, which further improves it. And if you're looking at using YAL versus GMW, it's a, it's a game that depends very much on the depth of the circuit and the type of network you're in. So if you have a high latency network, uh, then you may want to use YAL because you only have a few number of rounds. And if you're going to use YAL, then you want to use a circuit that has low and complexity. You don't care about the depth. And if you have a, a low latency network, you probably want to use GMW. And if you're going to use GMW, you would prefer to use a circuit that has low depth. So all of these things really intertwine. Okay, so thank you very much. <coughs>